Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Welcome. This is the uh, Open Line First Monday program when uh, we want you to call us with your questions and emails. Uh, what I do for this episode of The Journey Home is I invite a former guest back. You've heard a story. If you want to hear all the details, uh, you can go on the website, ewtn.com, uh, or go to the Religious Catalog and order the full story. He'll be here uh, in a moment, though, to share his, a little bit of his journey, but we're here to hear your questions. And uh, before I even mention who the guest is, I want you to know the phone number, 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, you can call us at 205-271-2980, or you can send an email to journeyhome at ewtn.com. Our guest for tonight is Father Christopher Phillips, former Episcopal minister. He serves in Texas. He'll talk a little bit about where he's serving now. Uh, he's what's a, a part of the Anglican use We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, you've heard a little bit about the uh, the new ordinariate that's come from the Vatican. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight, especially if that's what you'd like to talk about. So please give us a call. But first, welcome Father Phillips to the Thank Journey you. Home. Welcome back to the Thank Journey you. Home. Good to be back. It is good to have you here. I think uh, a, a couple months ago we did a, a round table of sorts on the ordinariate, and, and we wanted you to be a part of that, but if I remember right, there was just something you couldn't get here for that. I couldn't get here. Well, I, I had I had no curate in the parish. Now I've got another priest to help out, <laughs> so I'm able to be here. But you're here now, <laughs> I'm and, here now, and I know some of those questions will come up, but on this particular episode, what I, I do is ask the returning guests, give us a little snippet, a five-minute or so summary of you know, how did you ever become Catholic? How did I, that's, yeah, I've asked myself that a lot. How did I ever become Catholic? I, being raised in a, a, a home of Methodists, I was actually raised as a Methodist, uh, went off to college. You know those big bad things that happen in college. I had one of my professors who was a, a fine Episcopal priest, and he taught me scripture and, and uh, theology and really convinced me that uh, Anglicanism was, was going to be my real home, which for me was all right because my grandparents had been Anglican and, and so it was kind of a little return home and I, I thought that I had found home. And when I first got into it, yes, it did seem like home, but there was that yearning of needing to, to, uh, to find my real home. And so uh, after, what is it, about eight years or so, I really began exploring seriously and realized that I I needed to become Catholic. Uh, of course, it, it meant quite a bit of sacrifice. I was uh, in a parish, uh, had a, a very nice uh, uh, ministry there, had a great future, um, things were going well, and it seemed as though when I was following this pesky conscience that kept attacking me, it was like I was giving up an awful lot. I didn't realize I wasn't giving up anything. I was getting ready to gain yeah. everything. Uh, so we. Uh, we headed off to Texas. At that time, my wife and I had three small children under five. We headed off to Texas to begin this little work um, that was to become Our Lady of the Atonement Parish. Uh, when we arrived, there were oh, five or six people who were interested in perhaps getting something going. Uh, so I worked at it for about a year and a half and uh, had been talking with the Archbishop in San Antonio if permission would come for my ordination through the pastoral provision in those mm -hmm. days. Would he be willing to ordain me? Yes. Would he be willing to have us establish this as a parish? Yes. And by that time, we'd gotten up to, oh, 50 or 60 people, and so we were, you know, it was a nice little group. Well, literally on the eve, well, I shouldn't say literally on the eve, it was about two or three weeks before I was to be ordained and the parish to be established, most of those people decided they did not want to become Catholics after all. So we came dragging into the church, 18 of us, oh. and counting my kids, 18 of us. <laughs> Uh, the Archbishop still erected it as a parish, so I mean, that, if that's not the smallest parish in history, it's almost <laughs> the smallest parish in history. Uh, we started with 18 people, um, and uh, that was 27 years ago. Wow. And we have, since that time, grown. We have a, a, a lovely parish. We've got, uh, you know, getting close to 600 families in the parish. We've got a, a parish school with over 500 children in it, uh, pre-K through high school. Uh, God has really, really blessed us. and. Uh, uh, we have a constant stream of, of converts coming, coming to the faith through our, our, I still call it our little parish. And I suppose by Catholic standards it is still little. But uh, <laughs> God has done a wonderful work and we are uh, always grateful. You, your description of, of, of your story reminded me of something and I'd like your thought on this. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, in, at some point, you started 
feeling a, a sense, not necessarily feeling, but uh, of coming home, of, of uh, there was more, there was a fullness that I don't think you were feeling as a Methodist. No. <laughs> but you made the trajectory in the direction of Anglicanism and it was as if a trajectory had started. I remember when I was, a, even though I was brought up Lutheran, I was originally ordained Congregationalist. Mm -hmm. And, and I saw the, the crazy individualism of the little autonomous church that is answerable to nobody else in the world except just themselves mm -hmm. and the Holy Ghost of Jesus. I went to Presbyterianism because there was a book of order, a book, but it was a trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, does that click with you? This the, the, yes, the trajectory does click with me, and I think what caused it for me was the fact that I was, was fortunate to have uh, really blessed to have been born into a strong family with a strong father. And I understood the importance of having a father who is willing and able to be a leader of his family. And it seemed to me if that's right for the family, yeah. it's right for God's family. And so I was looking for that solid authority uh, and uh, you know there, there there was no such figure in in the Methodist Church. Yeah. I thought there might be an Anglicanism. I mean, I wasn't really thinking in these exact terms, but I see now that's what I was looking for. I was looking for a sense of real authority, um, a church that could say this is correct, this is wrong, mm -hmm. um, so that you know you don't have to spend all your time reinventing the wheel and figuring out what's right and what's wrong. But mm -hmm. the the this is revealed truth. God has revealed it. What is the only church that has that? The Catholic Church with, uh, with the, uh, the person of the Holy Father who is indeed our strong Father whom God has chosen to lead the family of God. And that's why it felt so at home when I arrived in the Catholic Church. It felt just like the family I grew up in. Uh, and and it, it, was, it was a perfect fit. <laughs> well, let's talk a bit about this uh, ordinariate. Let's say someone's watching right now and has a clue what we're talking yes, about. Yes. What, what is the Holy Father done? Well, the Holy Father has written his apostolic constitution, Anglicanorum Cetibus, which um, was, I think, a shock to the world that such a yeah. thing should be written because what he is saying is that within Anglicanism, and we see this even, for instance, in the decree on ecumenism, we see Anglicans being singled out mm -hmm. as being sort of a special case when it comes to the Protestants. Um, we see him uh, recognizing in Anglicanism a certain Catholic structure and certain Catholic truths that have been preserved. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting what Cranmer was trying to do with the prayer book. Uh, he was trying to basically fool people uh, who did not want to become Protestants. So he left enough of the Catholic stuff in there that they thought that they were still kind of Catholics. Um, but lo and behold, that, that Catholic material that was left in the Book of Common yeah. Prayer took root and, uh, and so we have Anglicans who have a real understanding of, or at least a sense of the Catholic faith. Well, the Holy Father is saying that is worthy to be nurtured and the particular gifts that we have as Anglicans, the patrimony that is, as the Holy Father calls it, and some people might call it an ethos, all of that is worthy of restoring to the Catholic Church, and that's what, we're, what, what he's really asking us to do. We're not bringing in anything new. I mean, the Catholic Church has all of the treasures that God wants it to have, old and new, so we're not bringing anything new. What we're doing is we're restoring to the Church our particular way of expressing and, and uh, showing and uh, worshiping within, within the Catholic faith, and he wants that now to be able to be spread throughout the world. So for those Anglicans who desire to come into the Catholic Church, they will be able to do so through uh, a, a separate jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So what in essence he's doing is, I mean, they're called ordinariats, but they're really dioceses. Yeah. I mean, they're diocese in, in every name, everything yeah. except the name. Okay. Uh, so, so that there will indeed be a particular structure for Anglicans or anybody else that wants to become Catholic uh, can come in through an ordinariat uh, and have a familiar way of worship, um, particular, you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, uh, a family. You know, you, you, when you look at families, they're, you know, okay, we all live in, in homes, we all eat meals together, or, you know, the, all those things are common in a family. But you know your family is different than my family because you have a particular way of expressing things, a particular way of living as a family. And, and that's what the Holy Father is now allowing us to do, is say, yes, you have particular gifts and particular ways within your Anglican family, 
bring that back on into the church. Come, be welcome, be part of, of that church Christ founded. I wondered if it was, um, would you say that this is cl as close to the church could get uh, without declaring a new right, but yet appreciating what it is that separates one right from the next. You've got the Marianite, you've got the different Eastern traditions, fully Catholic, but yet they come out of different cultures with a long history of their development. Well, that isn't exactly Anglicanism, but it is kind of like Anglicanism. Mm -hmm. So it could, from, to make it a new right didn't make sense. No, no and, and, and which is why, you know, we've always called ourselves the Anglican use. Right. Because that, that is simply a variation of the yeah. Latin rite. The Latin rite is our true home. Anglicanism yeah. broke off from the Latin rite, and so it's it's correct that Anglicanism should be restored to the to the Latin rite, um, but bringing in with it our particularly Anglican way of expressing things. Again, it's the way a, a culture was guided by the Spirit. There's one particular line from the ecumenical document in Vatican II. Uh, I memorize it because I remember when on my own journey. Uh, uh, Father Hardin's catechism made a big point about it, and, and there was a, a verse, in it, not verse, but a line that said, lest we forget that whatever the Holy Spirit has engraced in the hearts of our separated brethren is for our spiritual renewal. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if this is an ex a bit of an expression of that, mm -hmm. that the Vatican is recognizing that the Holy Spirit worked within Anglicanism as it does with our separated brethren. We're our, part of our church through baptism, the part of the, that's right. but it, it's an imperfect union, mm -hmm. uh, but yet the Spirit's able to work because of the graces of the baptism. And so we appreciate some of the things the Holy Spirit has done. Yes. And that's what the ordinary has allowed. Yes. You might want to talk a bit about uh, ordination of married men, because you mentioned the pastoral provision and the ordinary. Well, mm -hmm. the reason you need both of those things really gets down to one of the issues is the ordination of married men. Yes. For those of us who married when it was perfectly legitimate to be married and be ordained. Um, so the church recognizes, uh, because of the high value that the church puts upon marriage as a sacrament, recognizes that we are in sacramental marriages uh, and recognizes in us uh, that we have a vocation to priesthood. Uh, and as we know, the church has never said the two are mutually exclusive. Um, right. It is a very important discipline in the Latin rite to, to maintain celibacy, but there, there's, there's nothing uh, essential about celibacy to the priesthood. Uh, so yes, they, there will be a place for married priests. That's not why the ordinariates are being uh, right. established, of course, but it, it, it's simply a, a, a practical reality that there are right. many men who will make fine priests who are coming in as married men. And, uh, and are able to, to carry out both those sacraments in their, in their, both those vocations in their lives. And when we receive people that, hear from people that don't understand, is this a challenge to the church's commitment to celibacy? Not at all. Yeah. It's, I, th I think the operative issue is that, like in my own case, in your case, uh, never Catholics, mm -hmm. called to ministry, confirmed by our churches, and then in those churches which really had no tradition for celibacy. No. Mine had, there was no option for no, no. celibacy, but that, that, that's not my point. The clear call to marriage, yet then become Catholic. Now mm -hmm. what? And the mm -hmm. church's little pastoral provision, it's a pastoral way, mm -hmm. right, of affirming this call to ministry, and yet also affirming the marriage that we were called to. Absolutely. And blessed, and that, blessed to be married. So. That's right, that's right. Yes, that's right. That's precisely what I was doing. So uh, I, I think the, when one looks at the, uh, at, at the document, the wording, of Anglicanorum Cheribus, one sees that there is great care being taken. That this is not a way that that uh, a married man can simply sneak in the back door uh, and I'm married, but I really want to be a Catholic priest, so I think I'll sneak in there. No, it's it's going yeah. to be very carefully looked at. Each case has to be looked at, and when uh, when an ordinary is is uh, appointed for a given ordinary, at say the ordinary for the United States, when an ordinary is appointed, he will have his council of priests. Every single case like this needs to yeah. be looked at carefully and then sent to Rome for approval before a man can be ordained. So an ordinary is not simply going to be able to ordain married men willy-nilly and, and change yeah. all sorts of things in the church. Not at all. Uh, yeah, because one of the issues that they'll be facing, right, is that, uh, uh, let's face it, among Anglicans, the, the issues of divorce and remarriage uh, the rules were slightly different in the yeah. Anglican Church That's than the right. Catholic Church, That's so right. th there's going to be those issues that are going to have to be dealt with. How have you found 
uh, people are responding to the ordinary, uh, the idea of it, both in the church as well as outside. I, uh, and I have to be very honest and say I haven't heard a single person say it's a bad idea. Uh, most of us are extremely excited about it. Of course, in our parish, we're all yeah, very excited right, about right, it, right. obviously. Um, but even amongst my, my Catholic brethren, the, the, in fact, we had a, a meeting of, of a priest just the other day. As you know, our Archbishop is headed off to Los Angeles, and we're sorry to lose him, but uh, it's a great That's blessing right. for Los Angeles. Right. So we had a, a, a priest gathering to, to kind of say farewell to our Archbishop. And a lot of them, uh, a lot of the priests, in fact, some of the priests that I really don't know all that well, came up, wanted to know, well, what's happening with the Ordinariate? They all seem to know yeah. about it. Yeah. So it, it seems to have captured the imagination of, uh, of many Are you people. seeing Anglicans that, uh, is it, is it leaning the needle towards their return to the church? Absolutely, and of okay. course we have, yeah, uh, you know, the the uh, traditional Anglican communion known as TAC um, by its by its initials, of course, has been at the forefront in making the request for this, uh, and there are certainly many of them. Uh, the Anglican Church in America uh, uh, is is the, the the local TAC in in this country. Um, they are certainly uh, many of them ready ready for this uh, ordinary at now, and I hear regularly. I mean, scarcely does a day go by that I don't get a call from at least one uh, Anglican clergyman of, of wow. some stripe, either Episcopalian okay. or continuing Anglican. They're calling, they're wanting to know. Of course, all I can tell them now is, well, when the ordinary is appointed, that's who you yeah. need to talk to. <laughs> and let me just ma throw this little point in here, too, that uh, Coming Home Network International, you'll see the phone number later. Uh, if you got questions, if you're on the journey, give us a call too, and and we'll. That's why we exist is to help yes. people make this transition, and especially if you're an Anglican and you want to, who do you talk to about the ordinary? Well, we can at least get you connected to the people mm -hmm. you need to get connected to. We have a caller already, and let's take our first caller, Amy from North Carolina. Hello, Amy. What's your question? Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I just had a question. Um, I found this very interesting. Is there a corollary um, for the Anglican Church? Um, similar with uh, Orthodox Church in that their belief system with Catholics are so similar as you've explained. Um, could there possibly be something like this in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Well, of course, the Orthodox Church is in a very situation, a very different situation than, than Anglicans. Uh, the Catholic Church recognizes the, the fullness of the faith in the Orthodox Church and, and completely recognizes valid sacraments, and, and so right. the Orthodox are in a very different situation uh, than, than the Anglicans are. And the Catholic Church also has its various Eastern rites already, right. uh, which, yep. which correspond to the various Orthodox uh, uh, churches. Mm -hmm. So it, it would be somewhat different. I mean, I don't know if you, what, what you think about no. the question, but. No, I agree, and, and, and I think um, many of us, especially coming from Protestant backgrounds, were influenced by Anglican thinking that had the, the, the three-branch theory <laughs> idea, yes. you know, and we get this ingrained in us mm -hmm. that, that, well, or, or the multiple-branch theory. Mm -hmm. Well, there was Jesus starting a, 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 an invisible church, we would say. I would hate to say that, but that's what we used to think, mm -hmm. or at least a church that got divided into many, 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 many branches, and now you can't tell which is the church anymore. That's where, where I came from. But there was the, Ang those, the view was the Anglican, the Orthodox, and the Catholic. That's right, that's right. And that's one view, which is not, that's the point, it is not. Newman tried to prove that was true. <laughs> Look where he ended up. That's right, he became Catholic <laughs> because there's no, there's no via media, there's no that, middle way. That's right. Uh, so it isn't exactly the same. Uh, we don't want to, especially if there's any Orthodox, we don't want to imply that it is uh, Absolutely is not. The same. In fact, I, I think the ordinariats, maybe, and, and I'm, I'm only uh, kind of guessing, you know, and I, I've got as much right to guess about the future as anybody else, right? <laughs> uh, I'm thinking that the ordinariat may be a door, a bridge, for many kinds of Protestants to come into the Catholic Church. Um, because Anglicanism has always straddled those two worlds. Yeah. And for us to maintain uh, that Anglican identity as the Holy Father wants us to do, it still gives enough familiar stuff, you know, our hymnody, our, uh, our, the, the way our, our parishes are. Uh, I found many Protestants will come to us at Our Lady of the Atonement and find it very comfortable. Now, they'll be coming to a solemn high mass where you can hardly see the altar for the smoke and, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, uh, stuff going on, you know, bells ringing and everything. <laughs> and so it's not like they were accustomed to that style of worship, but there's something about 
the style of preaching, our, our love for the scriptures, which and in saying that I don't mean that other Catholics don't love scriptures, but I mean there's a particular way of approaching the scriptures and, and uh, uh, just a particular way of, of being that is familiar to many Protestants. So I frequently will be uh, witnessing the profession of faith of someone from the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Lutheran Church, and they're coming on in to the Catholic Church. Yeah. All right, well, I saw an email. Uh, here we go. This is from Alicia, excuse me, Rockford, Illinois. Dear Father Phillips, I am enjoying the discussion. Is there likely to be a place in the Anglican ordinariate for permanent deacons? I'm an ex-Anglican who misses the liturgy. My husband is currently in formation to possibly become a permanent deacon. If an Anglican used parish came to be anywhere near, I would be there in a heartbeat, but not if it meant my husband and I could not worship together. I sure hope there's a place for it, because I've got two permanent deacons in my parish. So <laughs> yes, there will be. The, 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 the ordinariat will be set up really in the same way as a diocese would be set up. And the ordinary uh, will indeed be the, the juridic head of that. The parishes will be set up um, fully as any Catholic parish is, is set up. There will be a place, of course, for, uh, for permanent deacons. There's a place for religious life. I mean, all of these things are, are mapped out. And if, if anyone hasn't read Anglican Norm Chetibus, I, I urge them to. It's not a long document at all. It outlines all these things and talks about all of the things that it would indeed be expected and permitted. Religious life, permanent diaconate, uh, priestly life, the life of the laity, all of it's laid out there. So yes, there will be a place for that. All right. Um, uh, let me see if we've got any more emails, but I, I did have a question because, uh, um, oh, let's take another email. Good, I'll save my question <laughs> when, when we run out of their, uh, their question. Um, this comes from Matt in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, dear Marcus and Father Phillips. I fear that this might be a question that is already answered, but for clarification, when the Anglican communities come home to the Holy See, what theological stumbling blocks are there for these groups to overcome in order for the journey to be found sound and complete? It, actually, that was a question I was going to ask. Are there mm -hmm. any particular theological bugaboos, stumbling blocks that are unique to Anglicans that we've got to make sure that when they come in, they really are sound? Well, I, I can't think that there's anything that is unique to Anglicans. Um, uh, you know, when I was, was speaking about uh, the Anglican Church in America, the, the, the TAC group in, in this country, I mean, they have already, uh, they already maintain the, the catechism of the Catholic Church as their standard of faith. That's what many of their clergy are using to teach their people. Uh, so do Anglicans coming into the church need to grow in their understanding? Yes, but you know, don't we all? Yeah. Um, so, but, but is there anything that would be particularly difficult to Anglicans? I don't think there's anything that, that stands out. We need to come to a full understanding of authority in the church, a full understanding of what the sacramental life of the church is all about. Um, but that would be for anybody who is wanting to grow in the faith. But, it, it's, uh, but, but many of the people who, are, who will be forming the ordinariat initially are already learning their faith from the catechism of the Catholic Church. You can't get much better than that. All right. <laughs> is there a danger in the ordinariat of, uh, of allowing a, a continuing feeling that they're still half Anglican? Well, uh, I suppose it depends on what you mean by that. We're, uh, we're, I, we're, we're supposed to maintain our Anglican identity. So, you know, we, we won't be half Anglican. We'll be Catholics who are expressing their faith in Anglican terms. Okay. Um, so, and, 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 and that's not our idea. That's what the Holy Father right. specifically asked for in, in this document, in, in, right. in setting up the ordinary acts. Yeah, the reason I'm asking that, because you know, we, on, on the program for all these years, I've interviewed many converts from many different denominations, and some of them have to take bigger leaps to become Catholics than others. Yes. Some of them have to really surrender it seemingly a lot more than others in mm -hmm. becoming Catholic. So, you know, when I think about my, one of my best friends who was a former Church of Christ pastor, well, when he became Catholic, I mean, it was such a radical shift in his entire life. There was no question whatsoever. He sees himself still as an evangelical. In other words, he still loves Jesus Christ the way he did before, but now he has the fullness yes. of the church. But there's been a few Anglicans and a few high church Lutherans and maybe a few high church Presbyterians that I've kind of wondered when they've come in. Well, you I, know what I'm talking I, about? I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and I, I think there may be some who have 
claimed to have moved into the Catholic Church, but they never really left their old home. Um, but for those of us who have moved in, we need to remember that for Anglicans, it's not as huge a jump as it is, say, for someone from the Church of Christ. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when I became uh, Catholic, I had brought with me all of the vestments that I'd had as, as an Anglican, the chalice that I'd used as an Anglican, all, you know, all the familiar things, and I, they simply were, came into the Catholic Church. So yeah. it was not a, 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 a while there, there may be a nobility for the person who is called to, to give up every single thing from his background, I don't think that there is simply in and of itself a nobility in saying, okay, you've got to give up everything from your past. The Holy Father has said, no, you don't yeah. have to give up everything from your past, because much of what comes yeah. from our past is Catholic, and so we're simply restoring it to the church. Yeah, one of the differences, uh, you know, when I think about my good Church of Christ pastor, friend, um, liturgy, you know, 80% of it had to be left behind. Yes. Theologically, no. Mm -hmm. He was always Trinitarian. Mm -hmm. He always believed in Christ, you know. He always, mm -hmm. he always believed in sacraments, but he didn't call them that. So, I mean, there's, you know, and they weren't valid, he knows that, but yet he, they celebrated the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. So, there wasn't as much he had to leave behind there. And I think the difference, one of the differences is that for Anglicanism, there's a liturgy that is very similar. There's many things. Yes. You talk a bit about the more of the Cranmer issue because uh, I'm thinking some of the uh, audience may not know who that person was, <laughs> where he was in history, what, what was his the significance of what he did why he was doing what he was doing, you know, when he lived. Mm -hmm. Well, Cranmer uh, was was the uh, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury at the at the time of the, uh, whether you want to call it a Reformation or the Revolution, um, and uh, was a heretic, no doubt about it, but a brilliant Latinist and liturgist. So we have the 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 odd situation, which I know bothers some Catholics by our liturgy having been brought into the church. We are using prayers that. Well, they say were written by Cranmer. Well, actually, they were. Cranmer had taken many of the great old Latin prayers and had translated them into superb English. Yeah. Uh, so, what were, I mean, there were there were very few there that were original to Cranmer. He was simply taking the Latin prayers, and what he was wanting to do was keep, an, as I was mentioning before, keep enough of a Catholic flavor so that the people didn't feel like they had really become Protestants, because that's the only way this Reformation could take place. The lay people didn't want yeah. to leave Rome. They, you know, they, they, England was called Our Lady's Dowry for a reason. I mean, they, it was it was a, an extremely faithful nation of people, uh, and you know, when we look at the history of that time, uh, the Pilgrimage of Grace and all those sorts of things, that that uh, you know, yeah. the people did yeah. not want to leave the Catholic Church. So Cranmer had to fool them. Well, he he uh, he really was fooling himself because he'd left enough of the Catholic <laughs> stuff in there that it's taken root and these people never feel completely whole until they are finally restored mm -hmm. to the home that they know in their heart of hearts is theirs. All right. We have a good call from Norman from Louisiana. Hello, Norman. What's your question? Hello. How are you? Great. Hello? Yes, hello. I was wondering, Father, what was lacking in your previous faith or ministry that made you yearn to become a Catholic? Well, I, I, as I mentioned, I think for me the 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 biggest um, problem as an as an Episcopalian or as an Anglican was the the lack of authority, and uh, I felt that when decisions were being made by the General Convention of the Episcopal Church, that was actually changing the belief, um, changing the theology. You know, it's one thing to have a General Convention change the discipline. Fine, you know. I, I mean, every house can order itself uh, according to its, the discipline that it wants. But when changes are being made theologically, having to do with holy orders, uh, having to do with morality, uh, that's not something that's up for a vote. And I realized, can I really go on in life belonging to a church in which uh, the sanctity of human life can be decided by a majority vote? No, I can't. I need to be in a church which says this is what God has revealed, this is what's right, this is what's wrong, and the only church that, that, uh, that is able to do that is the Catholic Church. So, you know, d did I want to leave what was the relative comfort of the Episcopal Church? No, I mean, I was 
if nothing else, I was on a good career track. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, practically <laughs> speaking, it, it would have been smart for me to stay. But I couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't and, and, and be a man of conscience at all. So I had, to, I had to arrive at the place where there was real authority, where I know this is right, and I didn't need to try to figure it out for myself. Did, um, uh, again, from an uh, Anglican perspective, I'm, I'm speaking from a former Presbyterian perspective, one of the issues that connects with the authority issue that I remember facing one of the last times I stood in the pulpit as a Presbyterian was I realized that the people in the pew were trusting that not only what I preached, but what I did as a pastor delivered grace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, became, I recognized that my ordination, w was it valid? Were my sacraments valid? I, w I couldn't say definitively that they did not get grace, mm -hmm. But I couldn't def say definitively that they did. Well, and I think that you know that that's something of the dilemma that that many Anglicans are feeling. Um, it, it's interesting as, uh, particularly talking about the clergy, yeah. uh, as they get closer and closer to uh, becoming actually becoming Catholics, the whole issue of ordination or what's incorrectly referred to as reordination. There could be no such thing. I mean, right. either you're ordained or you're not. Uh, becomes less of an issue. They're saying, you know, w yes, we, we believe that people were receiving grace. And of course the church says, you know, God can give his yeah. grace in, what, in, in yeah. any way that he is. So yes, grace was coming through right. through those sacraments. But they, they said, you know, to, to, to be a priest but yet not be able to be recognized as a priest by the vast majority of Christians throughout the world makes no sense. And so, uh, you know, for their peace of mind, for the church's peace of mind, and to be obedient to what God wants, they are willing indeed for a Catholic bishop to lay hands on them and ordain them as deacons and priests. Uh, so it, it really has, has, is becoming less of a problem as they get closer to, to mm. this as a real possibility. Uh, and all of us who had been ordained as Anglicans had to face this. Uh, I myself had, had come to the point where I doubted the validity of the orders that I had received, mainly because of the, the particular pedigree of the bishop that had, had ordained right. me. There are others um, who are Anglicans who say, oh, well, we have old Catholic orders and mixed in and all this sort of thing, and perhaps they're valid, perhaps they're not. The church is, is saying we can't live with the perhaps. We yeah. need to live with the definite yes. We know beyond any shadow of a doubt you are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And that's what the church is yeah. wanting to give. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful and precious thing that the church is wanting to do this so that these men who feel this priestly, and who, I shouldn't use the word feel, who actually have this priestly vocation, the church is saying, yes, you have a priestly vocation, and we're wanting to confirm that fact in you, and mm -hmm. hands are going to be laid on you so that no one, no one can ever question yeah. the priestly life that you're living right now. Yep. All right. It's time to take a break. So we'll come back just a moment. We've got a couple emails lined up, a couple calls, so see you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest tonight is Father Phillips. Thank you, uh, Father, for being here. We've, we've got a number of questions, and, and uh, again, we'd love to have your questions. It doesn't have to be about the Anglican issue, but, but this is one that I think is pertinent with, with Father being here. I might not know anything else about anything. Well, well that's right. I'm <laughs> well, no, no, glad to have you. And uh, this comes, uh, email comes from Linda from Pennsylvania. Father Phillips, how has the monarchy of Great Britain accepted the Anglican movement to the Catholic faith? <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't talked to the Queen lately. <laughs> I, I think when, when we, we, if we can believe anything we read in papers, which I'm not sure that we can, yeah, I, I, I think Queen Elizabeth is rather shocked at the direction that Anglicanism has taken. Uh, I think she's wondering how this 
could have ever happened. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, there, there have been, been different commentators that have said that, you know, she and Benedict have far more in common than she and Rowan Williams, yeah. which is probably true yeah. uh, as far as uh, view of life and values and, and duty and all those sorts of things. Um, I, I'm sure Her Majesty is not thrilled to see, you know, people jumping off a, a sinking ship, but hey, what are you going to do? Uh, uh, I, I, but I, I, I don't know anything beyond what I might have read in the papers as far as what, what she's thinking about it. Well, again, we've got the media when you're on this side of the pond and you're trying to figure out what's happening over there on the island. <laughs> but it, just from a religious standpoint, English, England doesn't look in good shape anyway. No, it doesn't. Um, but who knows what God might do. He, yeah. I, think he, I think, you know, God, God is, is uh, perhaps lining things up for there to be some sort of a revival there. Um, God never abandons his people. Right. It's, it's only his people that abandon him. Uh, so there, I think there are, uh, you know, a few faithful men and women. Well, there certainly there. are, uh, mm -hmm. and, and there, there's faithful Catholics there, and I've met faithful mm -hmm. Anglicans as well as faithful evangelicals. Mm -hmm. My, mm -hmm. my, uh, uh, my advisor at seminary was a, a good faithful English evangelical, uh, uh, the G.I. Packer group. Of oh yes, folk. yes. You know, just wonderful group of evangelicals. But like, even that was a movement, inter varsity, was a, of a trial renewal of England. And, mm -hmm. And I've half wondered whether the Holy Father in this ordinariate was seeing the need in England. This wasn't just for this little sliver of Protestants to come home. This was for England. Yes, yes. I, well, you know, England was called Our Lady's Dowry for a reason. Uh, England was foremost in the faith. Uh, uh, but I think we've seen what's happened in England is very similar to what's happened in France. Uh, I mean, different circumstances, but, you right. know, uh, France, the eldest daughter, the, the you know the, 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 the mm -hmm. where the faith was so strong. Now it's it's sad to see. Does that mean God has given up on them? No, of course not. Uh, and I, I really do believe whether it's in my lifetime or my children's lifetime, I don't know. But I think that we are we are ready. We're poised for a great revival, and everything seems to be lining up. You know, it's kind of like that perfect storm in a good sense. You mm -hmm. know, as God has put, you know, as He put John Paul II there to to really prepare so much of what I think we're about to see, and then to bring Benedict in, um, you know, <laughs> against I'm sure all the all the the bookmakers, you know, yeah. it, it it's we really see God lining everything up, so everything is right for us to respond. Now we still need to respond, uh, uh, but uh, there there are many who are ready to respond, and things right. are, are are ready, I think, for a well, revival. And when we talk about world revival, we see what's happening in Africa. Yes. You know, we, we just see that the Holy Spirit is moving. And uh, What's interesting with the ordinariats, I think one of the largest ordinariats originally, or initially, will be in India. There is a, there, there's a huge group of, of Anglicans, part of the traditional Anglican communion, that are there. And they're ready to uh, to, to uh, become part of an ordinariate. I, I, it, it's fascinating to see yeah. th th that this will be taking off there. Yeah, uh, well, that's exciting. Something to be praying for. All right. We've got Anne from Massachusetts. Hello, Anne. What's your question? Okay. Um, for Father Christopher, um, my question is how did it feel? I, first of all, I want to congratulate you for becoming a Catholic, and most of all, I want to praise you for being a priest. Because I, I have a lot of admiration for priests. We need you and we love you. Also, what was your feeling when you really, really started to know the Blessed Mother? And how do you feel about the Rosary now that you have become a Catholic? Because my whole life is the Rosary. Well, I and thank you for your question. In fact, I may have told this story when I was here before, but Sorry. just to let you know how sneaky the Blessed Mother can be. <laughs> I was, was uh, uh, a student, when I was a student in college, the only job I could find was that of youth director and music director at a Baptist church that was about an hour away from the college. We were desperate for money. I was a young married college student, so we were desperate for money. So I took this job, paid the grand total of $25 for the weekend. And I would have to drive up there on, uh, on Saturday morning and drive back on Sunday night. Well, I was uh, driving a little old car 
that had a radio in it that got only one station. And driving up there on Saturday morning, the only thing on the radio was the rosary. And <laughs> this did not interest me. But I wanted to have something going. Uh, you know, I guess you know, I just wanted to have the radio going. So I would every week I would hear this rosary going. Well, then after a while I thought, hey, I think I can memorize some of this. I mean, I, it, I, I, I recognize some of the words from the Bible, obviously. Um, so I started to say some of it along with it. And I thought, well, now I don't really understand what these mysteries are, but as they would go through them, I think, well, it's, you know, it seems to be an awful lot of scripture in here. So I kind of got into it, and then I decided, well, I'm going to buy a rosary. Uh, I, felt, I felt rather naughty <laughs> for going off as a Protestant buying a rosary, but I, I had this rosary, <laughs> and I kept it in my pocket, uh, and actually began to use the rosary, and I realized that that clever woman had wrapped this rosary around my neck and hauled me into the church. <laughs> so yes, I love the rosary. I, uh, I love the Blessed Mother. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why when we, we established the parish and the Archbishop said, what would you like the parish to be named? We wanted it to be a Marian title. And so we chose Our Lady of the Atonement, which of course comes from Anglicanism. It's a title that actually was, was uh, sure. associated with the Graymore Friars and Sisters who had become Catholic back in 1909. That's so right. we took that title, but we wanted it to be a Marian uh, uh, parish. Well, there are plenty of Anglicans that have Marian devotions. Yes. I mean, I think that's maybe audience yes. will realize that. Uh, that. Very few Anglican churches that don't have at least a statue of the Blessed Mother in there, if not a Lady Chapel. I mean, yeah. most of the Episcopal churches, Anglican churches that I know, have lady chapels. We have a lady chapel. Uh, of course, when you know, sometimes when people come who are not accustomed to having a lady chapel, they think it's the ladies' chapel, <laughs> and that it's for some reason set aside for ladies' prayers or something. No, it's the it's Our Lady's chapel, uh, and uh, we certainly have one. All right, we have an email from uh, David from Fort Worth. Uh, Marcus and Father Phillips, I am enjoying the broadcast. How does the Anglican Communion treat contraception? I understand this is an issue in the Orthodox tradition. Uh, well, certainly the, the Anglican Communion officially treats contraception as something that is, in most cases, a moral good. Um, and, you know, I was certainly taught that, that, uh, you know, uh, part of your responsibility in marriage is to, uh, uh, you know, make sure that you have some form of contraception so that you don't go, you know, populating this world with too many children. Well, I mean, the, the results are showing the church is dying. I mean, you yeah. know, you, you, you look at the statistics and, you know, their, their funerals outstrip their baptisms, you know, probably, you know, five to one. Um, so, yes, con contraception is certainly accepted uh, within Anglicanism. Now, there may be individual Anglicans who understand the moral issue and do not involve right. themselves in the contraceptive mentality, but as a church, no, it's seen as a moral good. And as an individual Anglican, they're free to decide on they their own conscience. They can decide for themselves, that's right. That's right. It's really an issue of conscience that's amongst, right. amongst Anglicans. Yeah, and the same thing with abortion. Uh, it's something you simply decide for yourself. That, that in, in fact, it may be a moral good in some cases, they think, uh, for you to, uh, to have an abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there was a, an attempt, uh, thank goodness it didn't make it in, although it probably will in the next revision of the prayer book, there was an, uh, an attempt to put in a prayer to be used by a woman after having an abortion. Um, and it was not a, a prayer that was, you know, her saying that she was sorry that she ever did it. Uh, it was just, uh, you know, a, a prayer to God, to acknowledging the fact that she had to do this and uh, she knew he understood and, you know, all that sort of yeah, thing. So it, right. it was, uh, uh, it, it's, it's very much part of their thinking, uh, which is one of the reasons the moral issues were, were overwhelming to me yeah. and that there was a great ingredient in my own conversion of the Catholic faith. And when I look back on that, I, again, uh, I would hope that maybe from the Anglicans, you got together once a year was the Lambeth Conference, or? No, it's once every, what, uh, 10 years. Yeah, okay, so it was the big one, but you'd yeah. have some smaller conferences yeah. where you would gather, mm -hmm. discuss these kind of issues and mm -hmm. vote. Mm -hmm. And at least amongst Anglicans, and I'm sure that the, the people that had vote were probably, or the ordained bunch, at least, where I come from, the elders may not have never had a class in theology or moral mm -hmm. theology, and they're the ones voting on mm -hmm. Uh, uh, gay marriage, and that's what happens in a lot of these denominations, that the people voting. That's right. Well, that, that's what happens no in... scripture knowledge. Yeah, well, that's what happened in the Episcopal Church with this general convention, which meets every three years. There, there are, are lay people who are delegates to the general convention, and clergy who are delegates, and of course the bishops are all delegates. Um, the laity who go to the general convention tend to be the type 
who have plenty of time on their hands and can afford to take a couple of weeks off and, and go to these th sorts of things, uh, they tend to be, um, you know, probably the, the, the better off folks, um, the folks who certainly they, they have no particular theological understanding. Um, they're the ones that, uh, uh, you know, have just been doing lots of things for the church and so they get elected to go off to general convention um, with, with no particular knowledge about things yeah. that they're voting on. Yeah. But the, yes, but their vote changes doctrine, not discipline, doctrine. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if the Anglicans did this, but I know that the Presbyterians a couple years ago came up with four or five new ways you could baptize. Do you remember hearing about that? <laughs> right? Name of the mother, the, the daughter, and the womb. You know, <laughs> diff, and oh, yes. you know, again, that was voted on and passed at the General Assembly in the summer. Yeah. In fact, I laughed. I shouldn't have laughed because we were talking about about a child's eternal salvation. You know, uh, the church acknowledges that any baptism using water in the name of the Trinity is a valid baptism and associates that child, although imperfectly, nonetheless associates that child with Christ's Catholic Church and uh, has received a valid baptism. So it is, it's extremely serious when we hear of this sort of thing happening um, when right. there is no valid baptism taking place because of the changing of the words yeah, yeah. For conversions now, it makes a big difference. Absolutely, yes. Uh, it, 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 more and more as people come to make a profession of faith, and I ask where they were baptized, uh, you know, it, it, maybe they were only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, right. Maybe they were, and now it's reached the point where maybe they were baptized using one of these weird formulae. So, Creator, Redeemer, Sanctifier, yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard that. So we do conditional baptism if there's any doubt whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. All right. Call from Arizona. Hello, Ed. What's your question? Hi. Thank you very much for taking my call. I'm sure. currently in the uh, Anglican Church of America, mm -hmm. and uh, I would like to ask, Father, if the apostolic constitution is ratified, how will the uh, Roman Catholic Church handle us as open communicants? All right. Thank you, Ed. I'm sorry, what do you mean as open communicants? You still there, Ed? He's, uh, he's gone. Huh? Okay, well, well the, the, when, the, when the ordinariate is established, uh, for those, those Anglicans that want to come into it, of course, as, as all of us do, I mean, they, 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 they will be brought in as a group, but within the group, I mean, each individual has to say, yes, I, I, I accept and believe the Catholic faith. Right. Um, so, you know, will it be possible for uh, an Anglican not to be not not to make a profession of faith, but just as an Anglican pop into an ordinary at parish and say, oh, I'm going to receive communion." No, I mean the, the, right. the you, you you need to be uh, fully part of the Catholic Church in order to receive holy communion. We do not have open communion in the Catholic Church, uh, so I, I'm not sure if that's what he was yeah. what he was getting at. If, if, but certainly for those who come into the ordinary at, they will be Catholics. We want to pray for our, our brother Ed there, who's mm -hmm. who's uh, looking at the main issue. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, there's a lot of Anglicans out there that are, are really in a difficult place mm -hmm. because they certainly are not happy with where they're seeing Anglicanism going. Mm -hmm. uh, they see this generous offer by the Holy Father, but do they make the step? Mm -hmm. uh, and I know some are are starting off to start fresh, you know, yes. start a new mm -hmm. branch of a new uh, group of Anglicans. So we want to pray for them. That well, I, and I talk to many of them. I, I, get, I get calls from, from many of them and have an opportunity to speak with them. And, and very often we'll find out that it really is, you know, maybe one particular small issue that doesn't even have to be an issue that is making them hesitant. Yeah. And, and uh, that's why, you know, I would encourage, you know, Ed or anybody else, you know, Call someone, call me, call you, call someone, and, and talk about this because very often we'll find that that it's not really an issue at all, uh, and and can be very easily taken care of. So you know the the best thing is communication. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we got an email from um, he signed himself confused in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Hello, Marcus and Father. I have in conversations with my Protestant friends struggled with the correct explanation of sacrament of reconciliation or confession to a priest. Their standard response is, quote, why do I need to confess to a priest? Why not talk directly to God? Would you mind elaborating to clear this up? Well, when you're confessing to a priest, you are talking directly to God. <laughs> I'm, I'm just there to be his ears and his mouth. Um, but we know that, that Christ himself established this uh, as a sacrament. 
he was the one that said to, to the apostles, whosoever sins you, you uh, retain, they're retained. Whoever you forgive, they're forgiven. Um, this is a sacrament that Christ has given us. And what a freeing, wonderful sacrament it is. Having grown up in a situation where I didn't go to confession and now actually being able to go to confession, it's uh, the first time I ever went to confession, it was the most freeing thing that I ever, ever did. And I'd been spending my life, you know, vaguely, basically telling God what my sins were, but I never really got down to the, to the specifics until I had to really go to confession, make an examination of conscience beforehand, and take those sins in there, speak them out loud, and receive God's absolution from that. So, uh, you know, why do you have to do that? Because Christ says that's what we're supposed to do. That's why He gave us the sacrament, because He loves us. Excellent. Let's see if we get one more call in. Barbara from North Carolina. Hello, what's your question? Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Sure, Barbara. Um, I'm the wife of a former Episcopal priest, uh -huh. and my concern was on the... Um, your voice. <laughs> my husband saying, your voice is on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, my concern was about the Episcopal view of the real presence. Because we always believed in the real presence, but it was not the deep understanding of the Catholic Church of body, soul, and uh, divinity of Jesus being present. Mm -hmm. And that might be a problem for some Episcopalians coming into the Catholic Church. Yes, thanks, Barbara. I doubt that it'll be a problem for those Episcopalians who are actually wanting to come into the Catholic Church because they already believe it. I believed it as an Episcopalian. And I, I in fact, that's what I was teaching to my, my Episcopalian congregation uh, and then realized, you know, they're paying me to teach them Anglican doctrine, and this is not Anglican doctrine. Um, so, you know, another reason for it to be, you know, truth in advertising, be honest, get out, go to the church that does teach that. So, no, many Episcopalians do uh, 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 understand the sacrament in exactly the way the Catholic Church uh, teaches it, uh, because so much of the liturgy that we use speaks in those terms. I mean, we when 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 an Anglican uh, celebrates out of the Book of Common Prayer, those are the very words that he says: "This is my body, uh, yeah. this is my blood." So uh, they're, they're not; uh, it's not unfamiliar to them now. If someone has a real problem with that, they're probably not coming to knock on the on the door of the Catholic Church because if people know anything about the Catholic Church, they know what it believes about the Blessed Sacrament. I want to mention to anyone who's listening, uh, especially Anglicans out there that want more discussion on this real presence issue, Dwight Longnecker wrote a fine article about this very issue called the real presence. If you go to the chnetwork.org website, Coming Home Network, you'll see it later. Go on our website and do a, a, a Google search on our website for The Real Presence. The article that Dwight wrote is posted there. It might be available on his blog. But he makes a big point that historically the use of the phrase real presence in Anglicanism got a little slippery there <laughs> over the years. That's right, which what, we jokingly said became the real absence. Yes, <laughs> yeah, what did it mean? And it was yeah. used to mean something different, yet to say we believe in the real presence, but what do you mm -hmm. say you're meaning? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think that's what, what uh, our caller was getting at, and, and I, mm -hmm. I, your answer was, was right on, Father, but I, just in case you want to talk about more. Father, let's, uh, real quickly, Let's say an Angl another Anglican's watching. Uh, why should they come home? Why should they come home? Because that's what Jesus wants you to do. I know this is what Christ wants. You know, Christ, I mean, he's, he spent his last night before he was betrayed praying that they might be one. He wants us to be in the one church that he founded. I mean, I can't believe for a minute that, that uh, he's pleased with yeah. this kind of shattered thing uh, that, that we've got around us called of the church, the various churches. Uh, that's the biggest reason why Jesus wants you to. And there's, it's, it is a wonderful home. I, now, I was raised as a kid in a very anti-Catholic atmosphere. The last person in the world that I thought would ever become a Catholic priest was me. Uh, <laughs> I had no idea of what was waiting. It, it really is landing home. I, I, you know, how, how do you explain that? It's, it's kind of like, how do you describe being in love? I don't know how you describe it, but you sure know it when it happens. Very quickly, can we have your blessing, Father? Absolutely. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you this night and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. If 
Thank you for, for joining us. If someone watching wanted to get in touch with you, find out more about, is, is there a website? To... Google Our Lady of the Atonement, we're the first one to come up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. And our, and our prayers are with not only the ordinary, but with all the Anglicans out there. We want them to hear the will of God and to follow. There's some fine people waiting to come in. That's right, thank you, Father. Thank you for joining us on this program. I hope it was an encouragement to you, answering some of your questions. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters through baptism, that's what they are. You know, they love Jesus Christ, very much a part of us. We want them to have the fullness, the beauty of the fullness. So that's what we pray for. God bless you. See you next week.